Okay. Well, thanks so much. I think this is one of the, um, hopefully, one of the most debatable and interesting sessions that we're going to have here in Panama. This is one in which I, you know, profoundly believe that it's going to help Latin America become a different region into the future. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, you know, what we're going to talk about is how, you know, innovation can actually increase the level of competitiveness that Latin America has today in the different countries. To start the session, um, let me make a quick introduction in terms of, you know, who are the panelists that we have today. Uh, we have um, a very interesting set of panelists today with us. Let me start with Gary Coleman, who's a managing director uh, for Global Industries at Deloitte. Um, Gary is responsible for creating a series of strategies that allow companies to increase revenue, brand, and equity, which is very, very important nowadays. Right. Yeah. So thanks so much for you being bet. with us, Gary. Welcome. We have our in-resident experts from Silicon Valley, uh, who is uh, David Frickstad. Uh, David, you know, has a tremendous amount of expertise in terms of creating new ventures in Silicon Valley, having created your own, and uh, you are like the very important expert that we have on this panel, since you're going to be, you know, giving us a lot of highlights as to what is done in Silicon Valley that can potentially, you know, help us in, in Latin America. We also have uh, Minister Diego Molano, who is the Minister of Information and Technologies and Communications in Colombia, one of the countries that has seen innovation become a key part of the growth strategy that uh, President Santos has today. So thanks so much for being with us, uh, Minister. Um, we also have uh, a very important person in the, I would say, innovation and, and information technology space, uh, Sergio Rosenhaus, who is the chairman and CEO of uh, Kio Networks, one of the most dynamic and compelling companies in the region. I think he's one of the key examples of many companies, hopefully, that will create it into the future, you know, looking into information technology, data centers, and managed services, which is, you know, the core businesses that uh, Sergio attends. And uh, finally, the entrepreneur part of the panel, who's uh, Nicolas Shia, who has been, you know, founder and a key developer of um, Startup Chile, a very interesting model that we think that we can replicate across the region in terms of how to bring, you know, the expertise uh, that you can have in Silicon Valley, but have a hands-on experience into Latin America. To start the, the and sorry, I'm Alfredo Capote, managing director <laughs> from Citibank. Uh, more importantly, young global leader participating with the forum in, in different um, initiatives. The key, I would say, uh, our most compelling question that we have to, to answer today is how innovation can foster entrepreneurship in, in Latin America. No? And as part of that, um, as we have discussed, there are three major areas that I think are important to address this particular question, which is A, developing and deploying human and financial resources to new companies, B, rethinking governance schemes on how to you know, manage the, the companies that you have around, and three, creating a culture of innovation, which traditionally in Latin America is something that we have lacked in, in many, many ways. No? But uh, before I give you your three minutes to answer you know, your views on, on these particular items, I would like to ask the audience if you can give me two <coughs> burning questions that you think are very, very relevant for this panel to answer, and I'll promise you to incorporate them into the discussion. So if you would allow to come up, say your name, your organization, and the questions that you think is very, very important for the panel, that will be you know, very interesting. Don't be shy. We're among friends. So, anyone? Yes, please. Uh, hi, Manuel Rivera from Expansion. The question for the panel would be obviously, it's not a question for a US century. Use the mic. Can you use the microphone, Manuel, please? The question I will have for the panel eventually it's uh, if uh, uh, an environment like an, a business accelerator can exist in a country in Latin America without government support. We have all the ingredients needed to make it successful and relevant at the end. Okay, thank you. Second question. Debat. Thank you. Luz Mary Guerrero, Sergio Andrega, Empresar Multilatina Logistics. Globalization and virtualization brings us to very prompt, prompt responses in logistics 
related to payment means or means of payment. Global companies are coming into a region through organic growth, which makes them a bit slow, or through acquisitions. Which strategies can we use for multi-Latin enter enterprises and many more, which are not interesting in selling the companies, but we are interested in developing collaborative models with transnational companies? You know, I had the opportunity to listen into English. The question is how you know, existing companies in Latin America can grow faster, whether it is uh, via organic growth or it is via acquisitions. We'll, we'll come back to that. So to start with the questions, and, and I will start uh, with you, uh, Minister, you know, if you can give us each of you an overview in three minutes of uh, the following questions. How will Latin America really foster innovation-driven entrepreneurship? to ensure long-term competitiveness. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you so much to the World Economic Forum for the invitation today to discuss this very, very interesting topic. You know, in Colombia, um, you know, President Santos said we have to transform the economy and it has to be through innovation. Mm -hmm. And he always says one thing, in the public sector, you express love with budget. <laughs> <laughs> and what we did at the beginning of the, of the government, we went to Congress, transformed the Constitution and the legal framework, and now 10% of all the export of commodities uh, go to an innovation fund, a research and innovation fund. So the problem in Colombia is not the money. We do have the money. But then, of course, we realized that in order to have innovation, we need to create ecosystems innovation ecosystems. And we found out around the world that there are some key success factors of those ecosystems. The first one is that the leadership is, has to be in the private sector, not in the government. Okay. Second key success factor, the ones that innovate are the ones in the private sector, not in the government. Third key success factor, the ecosystems are local, not nationwide. So today you see the Silicon Valley competing with Boston or Boulder in Colorado or Shenzhen or Shanghai or Tel Aviv, but not the United States competing with China. Right. So the ecosystems are local. Mm -hmm. And the other key success factor is talent. Okay. So we have to align many issues, many elements to create those local ecosystems. Mm -hmm. First, we have to get that private sector leadership, and we lack of that. It is very, very weak in terms of innovation. Secondly, talent. And you know, in the, in the next room, in the, uh, uh, they are discussing talent. Mm -hmm. There is today in Latin America a huge talent gap. We have, we have the demographic dividend. We have the young people but we are training those people in the wrong way. Jobs are there, but people do not have the skills and the knowledge to take those jobs in, the, in this innovation uh, era. Okay. Uh, in order to do that, we have to also work with another element of this ecosystem, which is the academia, universities, research centers. And, and they are not ready in general terms mm -hmm. to innovate. Why is that? Because you have to put them together. And the, the piece missing is trust among them. Yes. We've done a lot of exercises in Colombia to prove that. So, but we need to, to create that trust. And of course, to create that trust, to create the, those ecosystems, we need to, to, to encourage people to jump into innovation. But in order to do it, we cannot copy models. We cannot copy what happens in the US, in the Silicon Valley, into Latin America, or what happens in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. we, we have an expression in Colombia. We have to, of course, take a look at what happens in the rest of the world, but we have to platanizar mm -hmm. the actions that we have to take. Because the drivers of innovation in Latin America are completely different from the drivers of innovation in the US or other economies. So we have to take that into account. So 
those are the, 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 the elements. And I, we always think, we always ask ourselves, what is the role of the government there? Mm -hmm. You know, going to that first question is, what is the role of the government? Because if you go to, to the most successful innovation ecosystems, the government basically doesn't play any role in the world. But I think in Latin America, the government should play a role to promote innovation. Okay. To make sure that the rest of the elements of that ecosystem, they have enough resources to do that. Mm -hmm. And it has to really promote with you know, financing, with creating uh, tools for those elements of the ecosystem to match and grow. Perfect. Thank you very much. Gary. Let me follow up a little bit. Um, it, it's interesting. When you look at innovation, you look at entrepreneurship, they stand on their own legs. They're not really necessarily dependent upon each other. But when you combine them, which is the purpose of this session here, you've got innovation-driven entrepreneurship. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that? And basically, uh, it's because the belief is that there's higher quality of growth when you have innovation-driven entrepreneurship as opposed to just one or, one or the other. So the other question uh, you ask is, well, if, if you believe in that theory, then what are the elements or what are the factors that really will drive uh, the success of innovation-driven entrepreneurship? And I agree, talent is, is one of them. And, and maybe one way to look at that is, is what are the millennials thinking about um, how to work and where to work. And if you look at the research around what millennials want, in order to be an employer of choice, they want to work for a company that has behavioral traits related to, to innovation. So that's a, perhaps a hint to the second question a little bit that was uh, brought up before we started in terms of how do you are successful around that. Uh, but in addition to talent, uh, there is the infrastructure piece as a factor. So if you look at uh, companies that are noted for their great competitiveness or innovation. Singapore, Switzerland come to my mind. They have great infrastructure. Not only the fundamentals of, of bridges and water and power and ports and airports, but also the, the more sophisticated infrastructure like communications and information technology. And then lastly, I think another factor that sometimes goes unnoticed is the is the public policy piece. Mm -hmm. And you ask a very good question, what is the role of government in not only innovation, but innovation-driven small business or innovation-driven entrepreneurship? And they're the ones that are in place to, to help create pro-business public policy. And for those of you that had the pleasure of being in the opening session today, you heard from the president of Panama as well as Costa Rica talking about their challenges with, uh, with red tape and the level of effort that, that they do, whether that is to reform labor law. Uh, that's not to get rid of labor law, it's to strike a balance between uh, workers', workers rights, uh, protection rights, and that of making business efficient. Mm -hmm. But simple things of being able to start a business the registration process, to be able to get power and water, the ability to buy property, the ability to protect your intellectual property. Those are things that in some sense, government has the ability to streamline uh, their regulation. And so when I think of, of how to be successful and how to jumpstart uh, innovation-driven entrepreneurship, I agree, I look, at, I look at talent, I look at infrastructure in terms of investment requirements, and I look at trying to create a, a pro-business uh, public policy. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yesterday we had a discussion with the YDLs, and so, so I'm going to uh, bring some of the conclusions to the, mm -hmm. to the discussion. And, and uh, the question was, how can we um, accelerate innovation in Latin America? And basically it came down to education, culture, immigration, and regulation. What we did in Going back to your point and the importance of talent, of course, you know, if you if you want to have a, a talent, either you can breed it within your country, so there you education and fix the education, or you can also import talent. Mm -hmm. I think there's a great opportunity today because developed countries are are struggling with economic growth and they're 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 losing jobs, and there's an amazing amount of talent available uh, and willing to go elsewhere in the U.S. and Europe mainly. So what we did in government. Um, 
I was in government a couple of years ago, we said, why don't we try and let's invite entrepreneurs from all around the world to come to Chile. And we um, boosted, really. Uh, and, uh, um, so there, there's an example. Uh, before that, I, I would say that government should step out, and the best thing a government could do to <laughs> boost innovation is just get out of the way and do nothing. Um, after being in government for two years, I, you know, I should, I would suggest that we drop ideology and let's, you know, let's see every different project and let's bring in whoever can help. In the case of Startup Chile, the role of government has been amazing. In three years, we've attracted almost 2,000 entrepreneurs from 100 different countries to Chile. So, and and that that's been that's been huge. Now, going back to the point of what's the role in government, I would add to 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 this that. I think protect entrepreneurs. There's a friend of mine actually. I, I heard there, there's a saying in Chile that you know from a big. It's actually from a very well-known businessman that said you know you should you should kill entrepreneurs before they grow, while they're small, and that's part of our culture. You know, and it's very sad. And when you see the concentration of wealth today, we're listening to David Rubenstein. We, we stand really high in, on, on concentration of wealth. There's a part of it. So everyone talks about innovation, but not in my backyard. So that comes to regulation. I think that the biggest challenge today for government is to really embrace innovation, make it easy, protect the entrepreneurs while they're small. Mm -hmm. Because when they start, in, in our region, we are in a, such a huge advantage with the incumbent. That's something very, very concrete governments could do. Perfect. Thank you. Sergio. Thank you, Alfredo. Well, I think that the, coming from the private side of looking at things, um, and this debate of how much the government involves itself into putting public policy in place to promote innovation has always been at the table. And uh, we can gather all sorts of uh, reactions here, I'm, I'm sure, in, in, in the crowd. But I, I think that uh, more so and before the public policy goes through, I think that the ecosystems for being able to deploy capital to, to foster innovation is kind of a, kind of a key piece, the initial piece of, mm -hmm. of building companies. And um, the, the, I mean, the US and some other places have done this very well. But uh, so, so kind of the risk tolerance of building companies where, where, where I think a lot of these things started. And Mexico, uh, the, the, the experience is that the risk tolerance in Mexico for startups is very, very, very shallow. And, and it's, it's very punished, no? And uh, so, the, the promoting people to go into entrepreneurship, as maybe as Chile has some of these uh, social conditions, is is uh, punished initially, and and uh, I think that's part of, of the culture. But on the other side, I think what government has really uh, helped to promote, like we we we've, we've seen that in the last couple of years, is work together with the private industry, which has the leadership of doing this innovation and pushing that through. And, and promoting kind of the initial ventures sides and, and together with the same risk tolerance, both government and private, uh, start promoting this. So I think that that uh, unlocking that initial uh, piece of the puzzle to be able to, to, to fund these initial ventures and innovation. And then innovation is not only startups. I think innovation can be incremental in companies that are established, but that's, that's a more difficult even. It's a tougher job than, than we, when we talk about innovation, everybody thinks about just starting everything from scratch. And this is just initial startups. And mainly also innovation today is seen only in the technology sector, you know, the, the software, the application ecosystems, and, and communications. But I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of innovation that can be done in an, uh, bringing efficiency to established companies that are huge and their impact in economies can be tremendous uh, to foster innovation within the corporations. And, and, and unlocking that initially from the corporate side or from the private or from the government side, it's, it's very important. And I think that the public policy works, works well. Um, Initially, I think that they should be as far away from it as possible, <laughs> but uh, in this uh, joint effort and, and building it together, I think that eventually it works very well and, and, and can deploy uh, a lot of resources, uh, considering that the talent is there. No, Mexico uh, produces a lot of engineering talent every year. Has, they have grow and grow consistently throughout the years in, in schooling, uh, at least math and sciences and uh, uh, skills, which eventually are, are in, I think, a part of a key component of, of, of fostering innovation. And that together with the initial part of, a, of having a venture 
capital and risk tolerance could eventually uh, deploy this much faster. Perfect. Thank you very much. David, your remarks. Well, first, I wanted to say thank you for having me. I think uh, it's a really timely topic because as we look at the future, I think the next battlefield is going to be all about employability, economic development, and the key driver of that is indeed innovation. And, um, you know, I live in Silicon Valley, and every month another government is in Silicon Valley with their economic development team trying to figure out whatever happened, what's the magic, what's the formula. And I agree with Diego, it's not a model to be copied, but I think it's very important to look at best practices in economic development and innovation, uh, just like I think uh, what Nicholas is doing is a mind-blowing best practice that's never been done on the planet before. I think that will spread. What <clears throat> Diego is doing in terms of making connectivity a human right is a best practice that's going to spread across the world, I believe, like a virus because it does have such a profound uh, potential. So some of the, uh, last month uh, I was hosting a uh, panel called the uh, Legends of Silicon Valley and I had 10 uh, recently uh, made billionaires on the panel and they were getting questions from the audience and there were some surprising uh, things that came up on the, on the models that they saw that worked in Silicon Valley. One was the tolerance for dysfunctional individuals. You have to be able to Very tolerate, limited. promote, work with the biggest jerks, geeks, idiots, blah, 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 on the planet. And that uh, was a bit of a surprise uh, for most of us. Another surprise was the whole role of uh, intellectual property, better intellectual property laws. Because what happens that kills and stifles most uh, innovation efforts on the planet is the protection of intellectual property. Too many lawyers get involved and you go down in the basement and keep your things a secret. And all the historic evidence shows that protecting your ideas doesn't spur innovation. In Steve Jobs' earlier days, he talked about how proud he was of shamelessly stealing other people's ideas. He didn't talk about that in the last 10 years. But I think it's really part of that open thing, because Silicon Valley is, is ripe for people leaving your company and starting new startups. Uh, obviously, I think another part of the, the model is a full spectrum, a rainbow of uh, capital, meaning that whether you're a, a startup or at the private equity stage or an IPO stage, there's a full range of capital available. There's a high tolerance for risk as well as there's a full range of industries. I see one, some of the governments say we're going to focus on software, we're going to focus on IT. And what I think happens in Silicon Valley is whether it's aerospace defense or biotech software, test and measurement equipment, healthcare, they're all covered. And that's an important element because it sparks serendipity. And I think 75% of all the great uh, innovative breakthroughs have been through pure serendipity. So I think as, as Nicholas works in Chile on his projects, I'm sure there's a lot of serendipitous connections between applications, technologies, business models that that's where the next big uh, things are going to be coming. I think the, uh, the other big surprise from this um, panel we were hosting was the role of government. Every single one of these billionaires stood up, pounded their fist on the table, said the government has no role in Silicon Valley, it never has, it never should, it never will, and they were absolutely wrong. Because Stanford University wouldn't be there without the transcontinental railroad that was funded by the government. The internet was funded by the government. Uh, Bell Labs created the transistor lasers, I think GPS, all were supported by the US government. So, um, NASA, the aerospace, was all there. So the government has, I think, two big roles. It's one is to take more risk and fund bigger visionary projects. The other role I think it's very important for governments to have, and I see it in Colombia, and that is visionary leadership. You have to have some Kennedy-like goals of putting a man on the moon or connecting your entire populace. Uh, most governments today are very focused on getting re-elected or even <laughs> the U.S. government is focused on making more railroad systems, which is from the 1860s, should be looking at uh, fully autonomous integrated mobility systems. And I think that's missing from the government support. I'm certainly not saying where I come from we have it right, in many ways we don't, but I think all of these elements are things that uh, spark uh, the innovation that's needed in, around the world. I think the other thing that's changing is what I would call virtual innovation. 
You can see at the World Economic Forum, as the forum rotates around the world, uh, the, the global leaders, the shapers, all of these groups are doing quite a bit of what might happen in Silicon Valley. And I think we're all part of that. So. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Well, I think these are, you know, it's a perfect setting to set up a, a series of interesting debates. What I would ask you to try to, you know, not to concentrate so much on the government piece, because I think that we have covered that, you know, very well. I started with uh, uh, Minister Molano. But let me ask you something, Gary. You know, in terms of framing the issue, aside from the government, what are, from your point of view, like the three major items that Latin America would need to focus on to really foster innovation on the technology space because innovation sometimes is misunderstood as you know being creative and being you know you know creating a, a new part of steel but really really focus on the technology piece of it mm -hmm. alluding to the comment that was made that we have a very young population and they're looking for jobs that are not at city for example or yeah. other entities but they really want to create their own so from that perspective you know what are the three items that we really really need to focus on in the region let me just uh, touch on another element of talent and then I'll touch on David's uh, business model which you which you raised as a, as a topic uh, on on talent um, it's a little bit like uh, building a brand. Uh, brands aren't built by advertisements at Heathrow Airport. Brands are built by 100% of the employees behaving in a way and interacting in a way with vendors and customers and their peers that exemplifies the brand that's trying to be built. So if you're a CEO and you have an innovation agenda uh, and you have a growth agenda that's based upon innovation, uh, it has to be more than the CEO's vision and the, the his or her management team. Clearly, forget who said it, but that vision is very, very important. But it's really everybody needs to to get on board with all that. So uh, somehow within the organization, driving the innovation agenda all the way down to the bottom of the organization, I, I think is critically important. Or otherwise, I'm just not sure you're going to get the the pace of change and get the pace of success uh, that you're after. Uh, let me touch on the business model side of things, and, and um, this might apply a little bit to large companies who have lost that entrepreneurship type of uh, environment. Uh, uh, typically when you are in a, a large business that has mature products, uh, you have metrics that sometimes don't lend itself to uh, innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Uh, large corporations, even if they, they do create uh, multiple new products and are innovative in their own way, uh, when you get to a certain size, the metrics tend to be a little bit about efficiency. And that will, that's certainly not the kind of metric that's necessary for all, all of your experiences and some of the examples that you've said. So uh, one of the elements is how do you uh, create this uh, innovation driven entrepreneurship if you happen to be in a larger organization. And there was a panel I believe it was uh, the, in 2013 uh, at Davos, uh, Christensen happened to be on it, and, and one of the agreements that everybody came to is that, is that in order for uh, innovation to be successful, it has to go by a different set of metrics. And, and, and whether it's a different uh, legal structure or something like that, that could be determined, but it can't, you can't necessarily build it in the same organization. You have to somehow create something that's more autonomous, allow it to grow, to, to, to launch, to commercialize, to grow to a certain level, and don't be too quick to integrate it back into the normal organization mm -hmm. of uh, slowness, uh, otherwise it will, it will die. And I was on a panel with a gentleman who worked at Nokia. I don't know if anybody in the audience is from Nokia. If you are, uh, let us hear from you. But this gentleman was actually the, the executive that was in charge of uh, Nokia Capital Markets. I may have the name exactly a little bit wrong, but it was basically predominantly a Nokia-sponsored uh, private equity firm, but it had a, a, a separate legal entity, it had a separate board of directors, it had a separate management structure, had a separate uh, ownership structure, uh, so that mother Nokia did not necessarily drive it, but had influence over it. And that PEI firm was uh, had a mission uh, statement to, to acquire. Uh, technologies that could ultimately be useful to Nokia. So this PEI firm went through multiple, multiple evaluations and acquisitions, and uh, the parent Nokia was able to uh, pick and choose 
uh, based upon its affiliated relationship. But it allowed those technologies to, to grow in a way and those products to grow in a way to get to be a certain size mm -hmm. before uh, mother Nokia uh, took it over. So I think your concept of David's concept of business models is is not only something that applies to, to small business because you tend to be unencumbered, but as we all know, we have you know, innovative companies in the FG500, like, like, like Apple, as you mentioned. Uh, but something, I think, has to happen from a business model uh, perspective in order to make them successful. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Um, going back to you, Minister Molano, you know what? It's very clear, and I think that your presentation, that ecosystems need to be created no? in a partnership by government and, um, and private individuals. But let me ask you, as you try to go forward, and it's a, you know, a difficult question to answer, I must say, but if you were to prioritize the investments that you have to make, other than, you know, there are many necessities across Latin America on social issues, infrastructure issues, and so on. If you were allowed to invest in like three specific areas that you would say, well, if I make this investment, I managed to do the leapfrogging that David was saying with respect to, you know, if I invest in a new internet in Colombia, just to use an example, that, that would allow to interconnect all of the rural areas in Colombia. That type of change is something that may trigger a true revolution across the region. No? Any thoughts on what would those you know, three items be? Um, of, you know, I may think that, uh, I could think that the first thing is infrastructure, but that, in, in the case of Colombia, that's already checked. I mean, Correct. that's, that's yeah. we're, but you're saying that, you know, connecting rural areas, that's already done, yeah, yeah. And, and we deploy fiber all over. Yeah, the, yeah. I'm the talking country. about the next wave. Yeah. The, so I would invest in three areas. The first one is talent. talent. Okay. And I would say talent, talent, and talent. <laughs> uh, because okay. basically, make the answer, yes. business and innovation are, are looking for talent everywhere in the world. I see mm -hmm. the key element is talent. However, once talent is, and, 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 and regarding talent, you have to focus on, of course, improving knowledge, but also developing skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, we have to change the way we educate our people to make mm -hmm. people more innovative. And I, I think you know some people mentioned here before that we have a culture problem, uh, which is that uh, we, we kill innovation uh, from from even our own homes. You know, yep. the typical Latin American mother. You know, it's like my mother used to say, "Don't do that! Don't do that! Don't do that! Don't take the risks! Don't take risks!" You know, so we have to to to, to work hard on that. But but you know, besides talent. I would invest on uh, creating th those serendipities, putting people with different skills, knowledge together. Mm -hmm. now, and that's the challenge we have in Colombia. You know, in, in our entrepreneurship program, in the government one, we have 55,000 you know, entrepreneurs, great kids with technology, mm -hmm. but they have no clue what the real world is. So we have to put together the people from agriculture with them, people from health with them, you know, and then those serendipities happen. Mm -hmm. And the third one is encouraging companies, big companies, current companies, to innovate with those entrepreneurs, you know. Okay. And that, that takes me to the question of the lady back there, it's like, what they would do, they, they should work with entrepreneurs externally, as mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. to to grow those companies as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. Nico, back to you. Um, I think that um, one of the key considerations that the region has is the lack of, I would say, courage to say, you know, I'm gonna leave my family business or I'm gonna leave the job that I got because I managed to get a relatively good education to come and create a new company, no? And going back to the question that was done by Manuel with respect to, you know, do accelerators work? Is that the question that we need? Or do we need, you know, true entrepreneurship injected into people's minds some way along the change of the education path that we have in Latin America? And this combination of having good education and accelerators with the infrastructure that Minister Morano was talking about, are those the key elements that we need to create the new key or the new de compras or, you know, whatever example you want to use that is very successful on a regional basis? In three minutes? No, no, <laughs> now we have more so, time. <laughs> Let me go back to Schumpeter. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that innovation is about the creative destruction. Mm -hmm. Come on, in Latin America there's no creative destruction. Okay. All the innovation... Or disruption, you might want to call it. Well, and or... So and of, this yeah. is, I'm going to speak 
what I see in Chile. Sure. When we see the great innovations are marginal innovations, are niches in, the, in, in industries that no one really saw them coming. But I think what we're really missing in Latin America is great innovations in the core industries. We need to bring down food prices. We need to bring down energy prices. We need to bring interest rates. My God. In Chile, average cost of capital for small and business companies, yeah. 43%. Right. Average cost of capital for, I'm a libertarian, by the way, so I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm coming from freedom. I'm not, but uh, f how do you compete when we know that cost of capital for, for big companies is 4%? Um, we say that we have this DNA problem that we risk, we, 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 uh, we're afraid of failure. Let me tell you, failing in Latin America is not funny. You go to jail. You'll never, they'll kick, you know, they'll kick your kids out of school. You'll never get a consumer loan again. Everyone will point at you and your family and your kids. That's why our mothers tell us not to be entrepreneurs. It's dangerous to start companies in Latin America. So, you know, again, we need more creative destruction. But there's no destruction, really. You know, there's no evolution happening. Mm -hmm. Let me give you some facts. In sure. Chile, 80 percent small and medium business, SMEs, PYMEs in Chile, employ almost 80% of the labor force, 80%. Do you know how much that 80% of labor force accounts for total GDP? Pick a number. Less than 10. It's nine. <laughs> okay, almost single digit. So how does it work? An average PYME will die by the, you know, the eighth year. By the eighth year, their eight, 90% of PYMEs are gone. Yeah. So. That's the problem. Again, government, regulators, you need to protect entrepreneurs because I think that, you know, kill them when they're small doesn't only apply for Chile. I know mm -hmm. it applies for Chile. And that's bad for our continent, you know, because when you have that concentration of wealth again uh, with those costs of capital, it's just impossible. You can't, there's no business that sustains that level of costs. So yes, of course, education, of course, culture, but that's like, yeah, you know, world peace. Everyone wants world peace. But let's really go to the objective things. What's, what's, what's blocking, you know, entrepreneurs? Why the hell isn't, you know, what's happening with, with, with mobile payments? Why isn't PayPal operating in Chile? You know why? Mm -hmm. Because the vice president was threatened that if he put his foot in Chile, you know, they would prosecute him. Think about it. Pay, so it's just, um, it's really sad. So I think we really need to take these things serious. In financial inclusion, it's not just micro lending. It's not, today we're having a discussion, the final financial inclusion, a guy was from Brazil was telling that his, his, uh, someone that works for him was indebted at a 1,000% consumer loan. You know, in Chile, a quarter of Chileans are paying, I, I'm sorry, I could go on, but, but no, uh, that's fine. That's fine. you know, I think in a, if, if we want capitalism, yes. let capital flow freely. It's not. Yeah. But, but aside, let me interrupt you. Aside from, you know, all, all of the liberties, let me put it that way, that are not existing in Latin America because of what you're saying, you know, going to the models of accelerators and trying to import some of the technology that we have around the world into situation of the companies that you co-found, you know, what, what are the one or two things that in your experience have worked or do we need to create a new model for entrepreneurship in Latin America? I'm not an expert. I have no idea. But I'm not, a, I'm, I'm skeptical of accelerators. What, what, as yes. a good friend of mine says, I'd rather have a, a monkey from a jungle than a lion from a zoo. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I, I think that, that you know, makes the point. Yeah. Um, I, I love the Darwinian approach, but do, do them all. Have accelerators, have incubators, you know, bet on some core technology, but you know, bring, bring immigrants, yeah. issue visas, just collaborate. And if the government are not governed, I have no idea. Let's, let's, see, let's leave ideology outside of innovation. That's what re what's really cool about innovation. And, and copy what you see that works and improve it and fail. But, but I think, again, I think what we're missing in Latin America, if we don't bring the costs of failing, there's not DNA, legal, you know, economics, financial, financial costs, we will continue on this self-destroyed, yeah. destructive pattern, which is have terrible. much better resetting mechanisms. Exactly. Oh, well, perfect. Thank you so much. Sergio, you, uh, I mean, uh, I have known you for many, many years, and I'm very proud of all the things that you have done. But one of the, the things that Kyo can really show the rest of the region is how you can blossom from being, I don't know, a 25,000 
dollar company to you know the company that uh, that you are today going through you know all of the i would say obstacles that government may have you no know, not being able to have the liberties that you have in place being disruptive in any way or shape that you can you know focusing on the equity creation that you want to have so if you were to replicate your model from your own personal experience uh, you know how would you just do it again time and time again across latin america <clears throat> Well, I think that the, going back to what Diego just said, I think that initially our, one of the key components that, that we were able to, to put together was some talent, no? even though the, the capital was not there or, or, or some of the other infrastructure conditions were not there. No? In these in this Latin American economies, we are lacking a lot of things that in other countries are taken for granted. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, starting from security to some other things. But, so when you don't have the, the, the capital side of it, and, and first the, the thing you have to have is at least the talent, and I think the talent is there. It's, 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 it's well trained, it's, 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 it's agreeable. Uh, at least Mexico, we have such a big influence from the, from the United States. No, we, we basically were an hour and a half away by, by plane to get to the United States, at least from Mexico City, and, and uh, we just turn up and we see them all over the place. We have the American companies, uh, the, the first thing that they think when they want to go outside, they, they look down and say, well, let's go to Mexico. No, they're right there. So we have a lot of influence, and we try to copy some of these models. We, we, we've thought about that, and people go back and forth to Silicon Valley and, and, and try to see what, what have been done and what works. But I think that building the, the talent base initially, no, and, and eventually, when you have a talent base and you have a, a business plan that eventually is solving a, a real problem, no, because we see all over the place entrepreneurs and the accelerators is a good, a good example that, as as as, as a, was said, that that there's things that are being done that eventually reach to nothing. They don't solve any issues. They don't really serve anything to the infrastructure. When we when we started and we, we tried to analyze what, what problem we were solving, we, we understood that it was a, a, an infrastructure issue, a digital infrastructure problem that was compelling into our country and that eventually was going to require much more money than we initially had to start this with. But at least we had the, the, the right idea, the right approach, and eventually we what we did initially is try to to stay away from from government regulations, no? Because initially we we could have started into getting into a complaint if you needed a concession. Needed no, so keeping away from that initially was done. And, and uh, further down the line, we we started uh, gathering uh, traction within the same uh, economy, no? Because mm -hmm. the the when we when we're, we're able to come into these other countries, and as, as it was stated, some of these countries leapfrog from technologies uh, to technology, because you can go to a country where, where things have not happened, and they, the last five years, they didn't take any action within technology, but you're there, you're there today, and you're with the state-of-the-art technology that, through uh, communications, you're able to have the same technology today in any of the of the, re, of the region's smaller countries, the big ones are it's all it's obvious, but the smaller ones, a city is in the middle of Silicon Valley. You know, you can have cloud information and state of the art computing power and telcos and all those key components and ingredients are there today. So a lot of them, if you are always bringing this type of technology and in state of the art, I mean. Uh, not underestimating what the region can absorb in terms of the solutions, but just bringing the one that's available there to the to the uh, at, at other very mature economies. I think is very well taken, and and I think that's something that has to be done. No, uh, sometimes technology is brought to uh, to smaller countries underestimating that they can digest older technology while new technology is being developed in more mature economies. And that's not the real that's not the truth today. No, mm -hmm. I think today everybody is well connected, everybody is well informed. There's intelligent people all over the world and in every country. And when you go there and you bring something that's not uh, compelling to, to what it's, uh, you have to compete in any other of these countries, then then there, there won't be acceptance for that and then the, the traction will not be there. And, and um, so I think that that's a key component of what we did, just always bring kind of the technology that has always been uh, uh, accessible and up to the same standards as in any mature economies. The talent is there, and eventually capital starts. The, the, re the third component, it just arrives when that happened. No, the traction's there, the talent is there, and the capital brings 
the, the growth of the company starts starts uh, gathering traction on that. No, and then uh, and the one on the other side is trying to. I think that fostering innovation within companies, which was thing that I was thought of, it's very difficult. No, it's yeah. a tremendous challenge for leadership to foster that because it's an attitude issue. It's a character issue. Mm -hmm. It's a, it mainly is attitude and character. It, it's very difficult to train. Uh, innovation or entrepreneurship is mm -hmm. it, it's more in, in the core of the people that drive that so being able to select the talent with those characteristics and you can ba basically retain that talent eventually innovation will the only innovation that's valuable is the one that comes from from uh, the the curiosity of finding new and better ways to do things no and um, and that's difficult to train so it has to be uh, a very the process of selecting the, the, the talent with those type of conditions, I think it's the key seed to really uh, being able to drive innovation in corporations. Perfect. Thanks so much. David, one of the things that you mentioned is that serendipity plays a very critical role with respect to, you know, creating disruptive technologies, the ones that Nico was alluding to. Um, some of the things that I think we're missing in Latin America is the right incentives for people to come and join you know, the disruptive companies as the ones that Nico is saying, because they say, oh, I want to be the next Facebook, Google, what have you. No? Could you talk about what are the, I would say, in addition to obviously the economic benefits, what are the, like, the three major drivers that you see in people's minds whenever they come and join a technology company in Silicon Valley? And, see, you know, and then I will open the floor to see the reaction from all of you to see how that can resonate or not in, in Latin America. Mm. Well, I think one of the, I don't always think the incentives are, are, are just financial, or certainly not from the government. Um, one thing we all understand about uh, North Americans is there's a high element of ego. Right. And it's uh, really cool to, to be on the front page of Fortune magazine or Wired or something like that. So a lot of the culture of Americans, I think, is very, very much about being an individual, doing something unique. And you don't see that same culture around the world. You see it in Israel. You see it in some other places where a lot of entrepreneurship is, is stimulated. <clears throat> and um, so I think that's a lot of the incentive. I think, you know, one of the things about Silicon Valley that's unique is there's you know, we work to live, we don't live to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite of what goes on in the rest of the world. Um, so there's a great passion, I hate to use the word, but a sense of greed, mm -hmm. that people want to be rich, they want to be, you know, when I got out of college, the goal was to be a millionaire. Now if you're not a billionaire, you don't get invited anywhere. <laughs> it's a strange environment. I don't say it's great. I wouldn't tell you to copy <coughs> that model. Um, <clears throat> but I think a lot of the incentives are, are what you want to do with your life. I think the other thing that I just wanted to mention is this whole concept about failure. You know, 95% of what starts in Silicon Valley has a miserable death. 19 out of 20 investments die, uh, there's constant turnover in the buildings, and they've come up with a new title for people called a serial entrepreneur, which means you failed a whole bunch of times. Yes. And <laughs> you skip all that on your resume and you just write serial entrepreneur. And it's a way of celebrating failure. And a lot of people will say, I want to invest in somebody that's failed because they know how painful it is to go through that process. And uh, I think that's a, it's a very unique perspective that we don't see uh, elsewhere. Okay. Um, you know, I would like to go deeper into this serendipity issue because one of the things that we have seen in, in Mexico, for example, as well as in Chile, is that there are companies that are trying to create disruptive technologies that go against the established system. No? Just to give you an example, there are uh, a small company in Mexico that's trying to cut down the waiting time where you call a bank and try to get a person to answer you on the phone. And that creates a whole system to say, okay, no, I want to, you know, just skip that and try to make it work as much as I can. You know, so from your perspective, you know, could you mention, and I'll go ar around the, um, the table, what are the most disruptive technologies that you see that we can, you know, create in Latin America? for your day-to-day, -day, stepping aside from the serendipity policy. Just, you know, three items that you think, well, if there were a solution, technological solution for this, I think that Latin America can really make some progress. Uh, look, at, I don't care about new technologies. I care about the use of technology. And I think we all have the right tools now. Okay. And the markets are there locally in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs should look at the potential 
markets locally because they are huge, growing everywhere, in every single industry. So I think it is not about technology. It is about the use of the current technology in a, in a smart way to satisfy our local markets. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I, I look at disruptive technology, and I, I think if you can find a disruptive technology that not only solves one of society's largest and biggest, most challenging uh, problems, but at the same time creates wealth for the risk takers, that's a home run. And so in the context of today's session, if you look at youth unemployment, uh, we have a society issue with youth unemployment. And if you look at where uh, youth unemployment is the highest, it tends to have public school systems that teach and have a curriculum of developing skills that have nothing to do with business. And if you look at countries and nations where youth unemployment is the lowest, there's a high correlation with the integration between uh, public school curriculum and what is required uh, by business for skill sets. And so if there's a way to create or utilize, to your point, disruption, a, a, a digital disruption or some kind of disruptive technology that allows a greater connection between curriculums that are generated by public schools and the skill sets that are taught with what business needs today and with what business needs tomorrow, you can not only create wealth for the risk takers, but you also satisfy that ego concept that David brought up because you're helping solve one of society's largest problems. Perfect. Nico. There's so many. You work in Citibank? Yes. <laughs> Are you ready for what's going to happen? Please. <laughs> Um, there's so many, in every industry, they're just fascinating things, but I, I really see it coming, crowdfunding and all the mm. collaboration among fi financial, not just banks, by the way, and you're not the, the worst guys, I mean, they're, they're really... <laughs> Thank you. I know. You're the, le you're the least... We're the least you want to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> but I know, but no, seriously, I think it's the, all the crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, your crowd, mm. uh, crowd, that's just fascinating. And the other thing, the other area that I'm curious to see what's going to happen is politics. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some good examples of digital, digital parties. Uh, I think in Sweden they already have like 10% pirates, the Pirates Party in Sweden and Germany. And I think we're going to see a lot of that here. I mean, think about disintermediating a terribly bad intermediated industry, Latin American politics. Yes. So, I'm very curious. That will be interesting. Sergio. <coughs> I think that I, I agree with Diego in some of uh, part of it because I mean doing true innovation in core industries requires a tremendous amount of capital, effort, talent and a bunch of other things that we may not have today in the ecosystems in Latin America. There may be some, some small pockets of it somewhere uh, but it's not the general kind. So really the, the application of technology in each of our markets that's really uh, upfront in different industries is kind of the way I think innovation can be brought into our into our economies into our markets and I think that's 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 key and that's I mean that's talking from my own experience that's basically what we have we have done in the, in, in the past and basically we the innovation comes from bringing very up uh, upcoming technology and applying it to the needs of our of our country and of our markets as soon as possible to be able to use it in promoting efficiencies in all sorts of things. I think that financial systems is uh, defrictionizing the financial systems in Latin America, and which will reduce substantially the cost of doing anything financial. It's, it's a major Huge. pocket of efficiency that's there, and uh, digital technology, just it's ripe for, for putting that into effect. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, doing so, what, what eventually would have to be done is using technologies that are available and applying it to our markets, which because of incumbencies, it's a very difficult work to do, but uh, we, c we need to keep trying. So. Yeah. David? I think the, uh, what's really fascinating is probably 3,000 different disruptive technologies out there that are all worth watching. But what's really interesting is how they start to converge, combine, and attack new applications. One of the most fascinating ones is what's going on with uh, digital sensors, increasing bandwidth in the cloud, which now gives us big data, which disrupts every industry on the planet. And you can, as you start to go through all those applications, you can start to see that. I think the other really disruptive thing when it comes to um, serendipity is new business models. 
we're starting to see that the big uh, investment returns, like seven to one, are coming from new business models. They're not coming from new technology. So hmm. crowdsourcing, C to C models, sharing models, things like that, are really screwing the planet up in terms of market sizes, investors, established players, wealth models, things like that. So one of the things that I think is really important when you look at serendipity is really spend more time investing in the future, trying to figure out what the future of mobility will look like, the future of energy with grids and sharing and clean uh, technologies, the future of healthcare. We look a lot at the uh, mo integrated mobility systems and you start to realize that if cars don't collide, you don't need safety equipment. If you're in a car and it's automatically going from point to point, suddenly your car could be an office, it could be a healthcare center, you could be exercising, it could be a romance car. The whole game changes. And that's the kind of uh, interacting um, business models, technologies that are creating totally new uh, innovation opportunities. So I like to say that when we look at innovation, we look at innovation as futuristic, meaning we've thought through what the next 10 years are going to do like you're doing in Colombia and say, let's work backwards from that scenario that we see might happen and try and figure out what we should be doing today with healthcare, health sensors, things like that. Because every, you know, this is what I study every day and every day I fall farther behind. And <laughs> the last one I learned about was that there's some scientists working on infinite life that through genetics they think they can solve the problem of death, which will give the World Economic Forum a whole new host of problems <laughs> uh, to work on. Perfect. Thanks so much. I think that, that we are exactly at the time that uh, we can open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. So please be as interactive as possible, please. Thank you. Can you stand up, please, say your name and your organization, please? Yes, I'm, my name's Don Ratliff. I'm from Georgia Tech University in the States. Uh, it, it seems to me that in Latin America, uh, in, in many cases, there are uh, no role models, no, uh, uh, no anything. Uh, so you're, you're not accelerating from something, you're accelerating from zero. So what do you do when there's, when there's nothing to start with already? No, no, no history of, of, of innovative entrepreneurship, uh, no, no venture money, no successful uh, uh, startups. What do you do then? Thank you. Nico, you want to start? Yeah. No. You invite them from other countries. You import them, <laughs> and they will come. Um, they're coming to Chile. I mean, think about it. They're, if they come to Chile, they would come to so many other countries in the world. So that's, a, that's an idea. That's an idea. What the government would do to open up to, to start from zero? Uh, Which I, Colombia is not the case. No, you, you know, but, uh, I think, of course, you know, creating quick wins and, and, and children, you know, as a, creating role models, that's, that's critical here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the region we have a lot of role models already, and we have to, you know, kind of uh, show them more openly, more actively. And I think that is happening today. Uh, look at it, when you take young people today in, 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 in Latin America, you see that there is a huge crisis with education. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all over the world, but in Latin America we had a, a very strong case in Chile, a few a couple of years ago and also in Colombia and in many other countries and what we are seeing is that those young kids that are in college today they realize that their future is not being an employee but they are starting to realize that the future is being an entrepreneur uh, and being an entrepreneur and, and we have to take advantage of that absolutely Gary? Yeah, I was uh, going to steal something from uh, a working session similar when I was in Myanmar. And uh, the question was, how do you leapfrog? Uh, how, do you don't, how do you prevent some place like Myanmar, who is very far behind, having to go through the same steps? And uh, the, the panelists talked about taking a look at the best practices. And so if a country outside of Latin America is finding ways to free up cam uh, capital, uh, for financing and channeling that into the highest and best use of that capital for projects, take that model. If there's uh, models for uh, streamlining uh, public policy that allows businesses to start quicker, do that. So I think it's, uh, uh, you don't have to create everything on your own. Uh, to, to be worldly, take a look at what's happening outside of Latin America and find out what's applicable to you and take advantage of it. Steal it, use it, learn from it, and, and, and do those best practice things. 
Sergio, this applies specifically. I, I think that they, as, as Diego said, there's, there's really good examples in Latin America from, from the entrepreneurial side and innovation side. We, the role models are there. There may be few and far apart, but they're there. Yes. And, and they've, they've done, they have success going through maybe much bigger hurdles than people in other economies which have better serving infrastructure on all sorts of finance, uh, technology wise. So I think that it, I think Latin America, and going back to Gary, has done that, has always yeah. looked into the world and say what's happening in very advanced economies, what technologies are being used, how can we bring them down there, the markets are there, the markets are ready, are there telecommunications for, for putting them in service? I mean, all these components that we lack in sometimes we need to, to, to complement them before we can use some of these things. But the, I, I think that, that, that good examples are there. You know, uh, me two examples of doing uh, disruptive business mm -hmm. plans or business models different that are very differentiated in the way they serve in other countries and bringing them down to Mexico, has, or I mean Latin America, sorry for that, but uh, have proven very successful, no? Uh, from many years ago, from the early web days to today, mm -hmm. no? And, and I think that's going to continue going so the society in Latin America a response uh, in, in the younger generations very similar to the rest of the world. The millennials act almost mm. uh, uniformly any, in any country that you go to, which is incredible to see that we talk about societies being so different, but when you get to this level of, of, of a younger generations, they act almost identical anywhere in the world that you have them. So that just gives you a completely scalable way of doing things and understanding how things will react in your country, and I think that's part of what we have done in Latin America. No? Perfect. I know that um, you know, for, for, for you, David, it's, um, it's something that is not as applicable to Latin America, but you know, one or two success factors to create something from zero to be highly disruptive and successful that well, you I have seen the, in Silicon Valley. The first mm -hmm. one is, I think, the education system that the whole world suffers from doesn't spur innovation. Um, you know, everybody goes at the same speed, the teachers know it all. I think we're ready now to make totally customized education that's more in serendipitous, meaning you follow your passion a little bit the way Steve Jobs did. And it's a continuous lifelong learning process and it's more based on online learning, finding the world's experts to be inspired from. So I think education's a key one. The other one um, <clears throat> is really about benchmarking. And I don't, as Diego said, there's no one model that works. When I meet uh, government people in economic development or foreign direct investment, I always recommend go, go on a world tour of innovation. Start with Israel, then go to Silicon Valley. See what Ireland, Ireland's been incredibly successful. Japan was wildly successful in the 1960s and 1970s. Then there was Taiwan, now there's China. And then we've got Chile coming out from nowhere. These are fabulously inspiring elements that can quickly be uh, copied. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question, please, from the audience. Thank you very much. Armin Ovanesov from the Accenture Institute for High Performance. There were some very interesting comments there around collaboration and openness between businesses and government, between business and academia. Some of our research shows that there may also be a problem in Latin America around businesses actually being open to collaborating with one another, whether that's large companies with small companies, startups with larger companies, etc. Um, what do you think might be behind that? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. And, and what I've seen happening a little bit on a, on a practical basis is that um, in the last 10 years when you introduce yourself, you, you know, the person says, well, I'm in the automotive business. Or they say, I'm in the big pharma business. Or I'm in the high tech business. But I think sectors now are really converging. And I think that there's an opportunity for, say, pharma companies to get together with consumer companies because of all of the advanced self-evaluation and diagnosis and online uh, healthcare that you get in diagnosis. Big pharma companies, and I don't know if anybody's in big pharma, but typically they don't have that consumerism orientation that a packaged good company uh, uh, has. And so I, I think that's a great idea, and I think the collaboration can start by with, with, with uh, companies that are in sectors that are not necessarily competing with each other, but yet I think to David's point, if you're looking at the future, how is consumerism and big pharma 
we're going to really collaborate in, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a good example about Colombia. You know, three years ago, just 5% of small companies were connected to internet. Today, more than 60% of them. The way we did it was just working together with big companies. So we, we, we called them up and said, let's, let's create this call petition. You know, collaborate and compete together. So basically, we funded the development of applications for different supply chains for different industries. That, uh, with those applications, they forced their small companies in those industries and, uh, to to join internet, mm -hmm. and it's been very very successful. We put together a lot of big companies. Uh, that really transform the value chains that, uh, and those value chains, of course, involve those small companies. And uh, it's been very, very, very successful. And uh, so now we are developing more applications with big companies that really help small companies to be more productive because they have to be, I mean, the whole value chain has to be efficient. And that was the main, the main uh, driver. If we align everybody with the same objective, then we, we can easily put people, put big companies to uh, cooperate, to, co to 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 cooperate and compete at the same time. Perfect. Nico, how you accomplish this in Chile, the collaboration among all the constituencies? Um, I, you know, I think Michael Porter has is partly guilty for all this. I, I was and, and business schools like we bought in the whole Porter thing, and and I was taught in business school. You know, you. And once the economy teachers would tell you, you know, free market and you know, and, and bring in everyone and prices to go down. And then in the afternoon, uh, the strategy guy will tell you, no, no, you need to block competitors, capture clients, and you know, just uh, <laughs> pr chase, chase substitutes, and you know, very paranoid. Which is, yeah. So I think, but but he's now talking about clusters. Maybe he wants to <laughs> anyway. But uh, but I think we go back to competition. I mean, today in the in this day and age. The real risk is not to innovate. So if someone is not taking innovation seriously, if someone is not collaborative, collaborating seriously, almost by definition, I would say that he is not facing any competition. Mm -hmm. Because if he were, he would be innovating. So if you don't see innovation, you know, you go again. There's not enough competition. We really don't, we, we didn't buy in enough to the importance of competition, opening the gates. We see more competitive competition, at least in Chile, more collaboration in exporting co companies that you know, are looking the world than you know, service companies or, or, or companies that you know, serve the local market. Again, th there, there isn't that urge to, to compete. But that will come. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm so optimistic about the next years in Latin America because I really think that the technology, what, what's going to happen in this region and the world, but at least in Chile, again, in the next five to ten years, it just, it just lo looks so much better than what it, it looks today. Perfect. I think we're getting uh, close with respect to time. Before I give um, my humble views in terms of the conclusions of, of this panel, I want to go around um, with each of you, and if you can say one word that uh, summarizes the challenge or the opportunity that we have in, in Latin America with respect to innovation, that we very appreciate it. So one word. <laughs> <laughs> just one word. I, I, I think again, just to... If possible. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talent. Talent. Gary. Millennials. Millennials. Nico. Just do it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking millennials, so. Millennials. David. Uh, say empowerment. Empowerment. Okay. Very good. I think, you know, this has been a very uh, interesting session. I hope for the audience as well in terms of the interaction that we have had. Um, some of the key conclusions I can draw and then we can discuss them after that is that uh, we need to create more ecosystems in the countries. We have to create more partnerships among the different constituencies in each of the players. I think that Latin America is willing to become much more disruptive. We need to have more liberties in place. We have uh, the talent. We have the willingness of the government to come in and participate. Uh, we have the capital to invest, and it seems like we have the ideas that, uh, that we need to work on. 
Some of the items that uh, we need to avoid is uh, definitely, you know, kill the application that kills the SMEs, no? Uh, try to increase the risk tolerance that we have, which is something that uh, we have not done very, very well. And to the example that um, Colombia has done is remove some of the barriers that exist, you know, in order to generate and foster the, the cooperation uh, among people and companies. I think the idea of the uh, defractionizing services and try to eliminate all of the inefficiencies that uh, you mentioned, Sergio, I think is uh, very, very important. I think one of the items that uh, was very, I would say, encouraging is that we have to ambition the future thinking about being how to create serendipity and be very, very disruptive. And at the end of the day, I think that uh, as big data, Latin America can be the most disruptive region in the world. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you.